Yeah, so I will present on Anonymous, the um, hacker collective, you could call them, or like Philip called them, uh, movement. Um, Anonymous is... Um, they, they are famous because they have no leader, no structure, and no political philosophy. Um, and uh, that can be debated, but the general idea is that uh, anyone can claim to be anonymous and anyone can do operations in anonymous name. Um, and this presentation I will base to a certain extent on Gabriella Coleman's book, Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy, The Many Faces of Anonymous. Uh, and Philip mentioned that she is a researcher of Anonymous and she has researched them since 2008. And this book, which is written for the general public, is a great introduction to them. So I will talk a little bit about Anonymous history and uh, how you can theorize hacktivism. And then I will end with, with talking about how you research anonymous and similar groups. So the history. Um, anonymous was born on 4chan, which is uh, an image board. Uh, it is uh, quite infamous for being very offensive, full of sex and gore. Someone said that uh, anyone with the ability to be offended will be offended. It has been referred to as the asshole of the internet. And it's also the birthplace of many memes. And people usually refer to each other as fags. Um, so the structure between this, uh, behind this image board is that uh, it's anonymous. And if you don't assign uh, a name to your post, your post will be named Anonymous. Your username will be Anonymous. So that's how Anonymous got their name. Um, and a key concept on 4chan is LALS, which is a bastardization of laughing out loud, which is usually written L-O-L. So to do something for the LALS uh, is very common. And um, as for Gabriela Coleman, she was actually in Berlin on a conference two years ago, and I happened to meet her and was even able to talk to her and record it. So I asked her, what does it mean to do something for the lulls? You do something for the lulls in order to kind of spread a humor of a certain sort. And it could be very lighthearted, it could be very playful, or it could be actually be very dark, abject, and offensive. And historically, internet pranksters and trolls used to do raids simply for the lulls, for the fun of it, for the humor, to spread a certain type of hate, uh, mayhem that gave them enjoyment. And that kind of humor philosophy was one that Anonymous uh, really embraced when they started to engage in their activism. And while many of their actions were very serious, they tried to inject that spirit of humor uh, in many of their activities. So one early example of lulls was a raid in 2003 that users of 4chan did on Habbo Hotel, which was a virtual world for Finnish teenagers. So they would register avatars where they looked like uh, black cops or police officers with uh, Afro haircuts. And then they would position themselves in uh, uh, swastika patterns. And uh, they would also block access to the pool by placing themselves in a long line in front of the pool. And if anyone asked what they were doing, they said the pool is closed uh, due to fail and AIDS. Um, so that captures the lulls spirit. Another thing that they did was that they went to a forum for epileptics and they registered and started to post uh, flashy GIFs like this one, and uh, which could then cause seizures, or that was maybe the idea at least. Um, so, but then lulls evolved into activism for Anonymous. Um, and uh, in the future, there would always be sort of a magnetism between these two. 
and uh, more activism-focused anons, that is uh, members of Anonymous, would sometimes complain that there was too much lulls uh, it destroyed for them. But at the same time, Anonymous uh, was born out of lulls, so it has sort of always been part of their operations. And um, if there was, even if they don't have any political philosophy, if there was one thing that could unite many members, it or many, many people who identified as anonymous, it was uh, anti-censorship. Uh, and therefore, um, this video with Tom Cruise, made by the Church of Scientology, became very important in anonymous development into um, an activist organization or hacktivist. Because um, uh, the Church of Scientology tried to get this video off the web because it was only meant for internal use. And then may many members of 4chan and Anonymous uh, thought that, no, we don't like people who try to restrict access to information. So they chose, this, uh, they cho chose the Church of Scientology as their target and their first uh, main uh, opponent. Um, and this is... Um, yeah, this was a very important moment. Some people even say that they think that this was the moment when Anonymous declared war on the Church of Scientology, because up till then they had only done pranks. They had ordered 1,000 pizzas to a Scientology church, for example. But then they post this, uh, posted this video, and this was the moment when Anonymous was born as an activist uh, organization. Hello, leaders of Scientology. We are Anonymous. Over the years, we have been watching you, your campaigns of misinformation, your suppression of dissent, your litigious nature, all of these things have caught our eye. With the leakage of your latest propaganda video into mainstream circulation, the extent of your malign influence over those who have come to trust you as leaders has been made clear to us. Anonymous has therefore decided that your organization should be destroyed, for the good of your followers, for the good of mankind and for our own enjoyment. We shall proceed to expel you from the internet and systematically dismantle the Church of Scientology in its present form. We recognize you as serious opponents. Um, all right, so from there Anonymous grew into a serious uh, name for activism and you have probably seen many headlines. They were, for example, part of Occupy Wall Street, uh, not least in disseminating the message and uh, yeah, spreading so that people could turn up to demonstrations. Uh, and this mask became very famous in the media. This is uh, Guy Fawkes. Uh, a historical figure in uh, England and uh, this mask became famous in uh, the graphic novel V for Vendetta which also was a film um, and, um, and one of the reasons why they chose masks was that when they rallied against the Church of Scientology they were the, the Scientologists were infamous for photographing and filming people who protest against them um, I'm going to take this off now because uh, it's a bit hard to speak. Um, so uh, these are just a few of the operations that they engaged in. As you can see, it began in 2003 as uh, prank things from uh, 4chan. Uh, and then over the years, uh, they focused on copyright issues on homophobia in, for example, Uganda or Kansas uh, in the Westboro Baptist Church. Uh, they focused on anti-bully campaigns, um, Operation Safe Winter for homeless people. Uh, they protested the shootings of Michael Brown and Tammy Rice, the police shootings. And I will not go into details into these um, uh, operations. I can mention that Operation Trump in 2016 was also criticized internally because some people meant that, uh, look, we are all for freedom of expression, so even stupid people should be able to express themselves. Um, the tactics we can go into now, because the Steubenville rape case was interesting in the sense that it was a case where law enforcement did not pursue a certain uh, rape case. 
so the perpetrators or the suspected perpetrators were walking free. Uh, what Anonymous did was that they they went out and said that, look, we have doxed everyone involved in this case. To dox someone is to identify someone. And they said that we will release all this information if the responsible parties don't come forward. And that was a bluff, but the responsible parties did come forward and uh, the case was pursued. Uh, they also engage in uh, traditional demos, like we have seen in Occupy Wall Street, and um, and also DDoS attacks. Uh, so DDoS attacks is the most uh, technical of the means. However, DDoS is very controversial. It means distributed denial of, of service, and it is a way to send lots and lots of traffic to a website until it goes down. Uh, and the reason why it's controversial in Anonymous is that it's so simple and it's so easy to do. And it also goes a little bit against the spirit of spreading information and letting people have access to information. Uh, so therefore, various fractions of Anonymous um, emerged over time. So previously, most operations were done by a core called Anon Ops. But out of that a uh, smaller group called LulzSec or Lulz Security uh, was founded, which contained fewer people who were much more security focused and uh, technically skilled. And they had their own logotype, this, uh, that guy. Um, and, um, and then AntiSec uh, emerged, which also had a strong security focus. Um, and some of the members from LulzSec uh, came into AntiSec and all these uh, operated in their own uh, chat rooms and so on. So now I will switch into the theory of uh, hacktivism, which of course is a combination of hacking and activism. So Jordan and Taylor identified two generations of hacktivism. In the first generation, they differ between mass action hacktivism and politically correct hacktivism. So the first one would be sit-ins or digital sit-ins where the sheer number of participants is important. Uh, whereas politically correct hacktivism is about um, providing uh, tools so that users can evade government censorship and government surveillance. Uh, it could be, for example, the Tor network or a VPN service, an an anonymizing service. Um, and in the second generation of hacktivism, which started around 2000, uh, three things are relevant in the way that they try to... Um, um, how did you put it? Change the information power. Um, that would be DDoS that we have already talked about, leaks, which LulzSec engaged a lot in, uh, but that would mean to hack something in order to obtain a leak. So WikiLeaks would be another obvious example, of course. And infrastructure was also important. Infrastructure in the sense that um, during the Arab Spring, for example, in o anonymous Operation Tunisia, uh, they spread so-called care packages. Um, and the idea was to defend and extend a secure internet for demonstrators and activists and people in general. And then we have uh, Wong and Brown, who introduce the idea of e-bandits. Um, uh, because e-bandits use, I, I will quote here, uh, using anonymizing technologies to create a transnational politics of no one. E-bandits are principled actors who capitalize on the internet and other information technologies to lead disembodied virtual attacks against physical targets in order to encourage political change. And they base this idea on um, Eric Hobbsbaum's idea of social bandits. So that's an old concept. Social bandits have occupied the space between lords, states, and the peasantry throughout history by challenging the status quo and those who benefit from existing societal structures. Um, 
so we mentioned the politics of no one, meaning that you're anonymous, so you you are no one basically. Um, there is also an element of Robin Hood in this activism, in the sense that Anonymous and WikiLeaks both explicitly see themselves as taking from the powerful to empower the disempowered with information and access to political process. Uh, so that's also from Wong and Brown. Uh, and they conclude that technology changes resistance. Okay, But now we go into the research part of my presentation. And... Um, Postel and Pink, they talk about um, internet-related ethnography because um, it's only related to the internet. Everything is not on the internet. In their case, they went to Barcelona in order to uh, participate on the streets as well as online. They did social media activism. But uh, I'm not sure how this can be applied for Anonymous where there is actually very, I mean there is no real location except for occasional ones. Um, but anyway, they, they thought that it was a good idea to live in the physical city of Barcelona. Uh, and um, Postil had a routine for his uh, ethnographic research every day, which was catching up. This is on Twitter, I think, or maybe other social media as well. Catching up, sharing, exploring, interacting, and archiving. Um, and he also used uh, tagging a lot on the tagging platform Delicious. So he proposes that tags might be an incipient form of theory building... Uh, and I thought that this reminds a lot about uh, grounded theory, for example, how we code in order for a theory to emerge from our codes. Um, but uh, Postel and Pink also problematize this because um, they say that uh, the tags are public and uh, tagging sites like Delicious also suggest possible tags based on other user users' tags. So how does that uh, actually um, affect their theory building, you could ask. So don't believe the hype. That's how I think that you could actually summarize um, one of the things that Coleman writes in this paper that we read for today. Uh, because um, she shows how each technological leap has led to a hype so that everything must work differently. She cites Manuel Castells from 1996, who wrote about a historically new reality that is fundament fundamentally altering the way we are born, we live, we sleep, we produce, we consume, we dream, we fight, or we die. Um, and uh, anthropologists actually challenged this view of technolo technology as having this power to change things uh, on its own. And then came Web 2.0 and social media with another hype that everything would change. And I would say that maybe now we're living in the mobile me media hype and the uh, sharing economy hype. But beyond all these hypes, um, traditional ethnographic methods like interviews and participant observation remain very important for ethnographic work. So if we go back to Gabriella Coleman's work on Anonymous, like I said, anyone can claim to be anonymous. Here I am, for example, in a demonstration in Berlin a few weeks ago, and I interview someone who has an anonymous mask, so I thought maybe he's anonymous. So I asked Gabriella Coleman, how do you research an organization where anyone can claim to be that organization? So anonymous is a multiple use name, which means exactly anyone can take the name. Uh, and it means that there's a lot of variability and dynamism in the way that the phenomena kind of merged. But on the other hand, it wasn't total amorphousness or chaos. Certain stable groups emerged over time to use the name. They could be found on certain chat channels and Twitter accounts. Yeah, and... Um 
she even writes in the book that as an anthropologist does, I watched, listened, interviewed, debated, questioned and prodded. At times I even participated so long as my involvement was legal. So uh, again, there we have a classic case of uh, participant observation. Um, and um, here comes the last Coleman clip because I asked her what um, what this participation. I mean, of course, I met her before I was in this program, and I only had five minutes with her. But I I asked her what what would her typical research day look like. Uh, here we are at the conference. Um, yeah, I spent uh, a couple years on their chat channels every day, five hours a day. And so that's precisely it. There was a place to go to where you could talk to them. And I gained the trust of, you know, not all of them, but some of them. And so there was some forms of stability that were central to Anonymous. But, you know, what is true about Anonymous in 2008 is not the case for 2010. You have to be very, very careful. Uh, what, are the, what, what you say about the subgroups, what you say regionally, what you say depending on the time period as well. Because exactly there's a lot of mutability. And unless you're there following them like very closely, it's really hard to piece it together. Yeah, so... Um, um, so Coleman stresses that the anthropological imperative requires a certain degree of distance while at the same time compelling one to delve deep. The trick is to integrate and go beyond simply relying on participants' explanations of events. Um, and she, she writes that she was sympathetic to many of Anonymous causes, but not all, and that uh, created this needed and critical distance. Uh, how did this work um, on a practical level? Well, her source material was basically chat logs because the chat logs included her interviews and her participation on various uh, in various chat rooms. Uh, but the chat logs on their own would not have been enough as a source, she writes, because uh, what if people just set her up and didn't tell her the truth? So there the legal records come in because the legal records, such as court protocols, they acted as a confirmation of the first source that was chat logs and maybe vice versa. Uh, and as we also saw, um, she, she drew the line at uh, illegal things, so she wouldn't participate in illegal things. And that also meant that she was left out on certain operations where she actually couldn't know what happened. But she writes that eventually many people were actually arrested and there was a court case and there she could read what she, you know, what happened when she was not there. Um, and let's move on to ethics because um, I think that this is very important for us if we want to research Anonymous or a similar organization. Um, law enforcement, for example. So uh, what do you do when you are apprehended by law enforcement? If you get uh, a subpoena, for example. Well, Coleman didn't get a subpoena, but she uh, was invited by the CSIS, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service. She was invited to talk about Anonymous, and uh, after some moral quandary, she actually accepted the invitation and... Um, came there to talk to a small crowd and she had decided beforehand that she would not reveal anything that was not already known in the media. But, you know, it was a talk and then there was an informal lunch afterwards when they asked more questions. And um, yeah, it left her with a very uneasy feeling because uh, even if you have decided to only talk about things that are already known, it was her impression that they, the CSIS actually didn't know, for example, how important media is for uh, Anonymous in spreading their message. Uh, and she also writes that in these situations, sometimes you reveal more than you think you reveal because um, it's... Um, yeah, these people are experts in dragging out that kind of information. So anyway, she donated her pay for that talk to a civil liberties organization. Um, and I want to end the presentation by uh, comparing again 
the differences between being an anthropologist and being a journalist. So in the in uh, American Anthropolo- Anthropological Association statement on ethics, the number one point there is do no harm. It's basically as simple as that. If something risks doing harm, you you simply don't do it, doing harm to your research participants. Whereas in the Society of Professional Journalists, also in the USA, in their code of ethics, number one is seek truth and report it. Uh, and on second pl- place comes minimize harm. So it's not even it's even okay to cause harm because uh, as long as you get uh, as long as it's necessary for the story because the story is number one. And uh, these two attitudes have resonated a lot with me because I come from a background of journalism and uh, uh, studying to become an anthropologist has uh, made me switch mindsets a bit. So yeah, that was my presentation. So now we can uh, discuss maybe after a break or so. Thank you.